will you say with me? Great is God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength, and our redeemer. Amen. This past Thursday, a group of us gathered on Zoom to learn about the history of this church. It's the third and final class of our new member series, and it's one of my favorites because the story of this church is unique and inspiring. But it's often a surprising one for most of the folks who do find us because almost no one comes here looking for church history or a particular quality or even architectural grandeur. The truth is, many of us who find us are not looking for an institution at all. Many come here as refugees from churches or traditions that have left them feeling alienated or sometimes cynical or perhaps even scarred. But while we may be distrustful of institutions and for good reason, we are hungry for community. A place to feel connected, welcome, like we belong. And that can be a bit scary when you are new. So perhaps we lurk online at first a little bit. I think there's a few of you there who do that. Maybe you walk past this church three or four times on a Sunday morning and then head to church street for brunch. But one Sunday you decide to come in through the door, not knowing what kind of place or people you will find here. And we cannot underestimate the courage that it takes. Finding community is not easy. And this is increasingly true, especially in our tech-saturated online world. Rates of loneliness and isolation and depression are higher than they've ever been. And this is especially true for our young people. And COVID just accelerated the trend. It seems more and more apparent that we are in a kind of crisis of community. Making the choice to join our lives with others is risky. It requires trust and vulnerability and humility. Rare commodities in our self-protective world. It requires that we give something of ourselves and learn how to receive. To be in real community means sometimes speaking a difficult truth, admitting we are wrong, or forgiving when we have been wrong. These are social and emotional muscles that we just do not exercise enough these days. In his book, The Anxious Generation, social psychologist Jonathan Haidt explores how our online lives have eroded our sense of true community. He describes how the rise of cell phones, and especially social media, have turned our focus inward, increasing our sense of isolation, while at the same time causing us to obsess over how others feel. We fixate on creating our brand and image of ourselves that we want the world to see, and then we live in fear of being judged for it. Hiding behind our screens, we engage in the illusion of community. Well, we may claim our kind of belonging, but there is no real accountability or true connection. We type things on our keyboard that we would never say to a flesh and blood person in front of us. And then when things get difficult, we could just click leave the meeting or go whoever we are with. Avoiding awkward conversations or uncomfortable truths is so much easier than staying at the table we never have to face our faults or learn how we may have caused harm. We don't have to listen to ideas that we disagree with or make us upset. We can keep our egos safely in check, and we never have to admit that we need to the problem. Because needing each other is, in fact, what makes us human. It's how we understand who we are and what we value and how we want to live together. Relationships create neural pathways in our brains and patterns in our hearts that help us to be more 
creative and compassionate and brave and curious and kind. Yes, it's just the stuff of every day. Those heart-to-heart conversations that go long into the night, the times we lash out in anger, and then we come back and ask for forgiveness. The times when we've had our hearts broken and then risk loving again. Watching our child struggle to ride a bike or master long division or, or lose a friend and know that this is important work they are doing. Struggling through our own failures and learning that we are stronger because of them. Awakening to the complexity of another person that changes our mind about them and how we see the world. The Ubuntu saying is at the heart of all of our relationships. I am because you are. Yes, relationships are messy and complicated and often painful, but they are also what makes life right. And they are how we experience God in the world. In our gospel reading this morning, Jesus shares this deep life wisdom with his friends. Now, this conversation is part of what's known in John's gospel as Jesus' farewell discourse. He's just a few days away from his death. He sees what's coming, and he's preparing his friends for life without him. Over the past three years, he has embodied a life that is deeply attuned and enmeshed with God. He embodies what it looks like and sounds like and feels like. But he's worried that his friends may still not quite get it. After all, this kind of heart-centered and interconnected life that he shows them is not easy for him. And there were many great teachers and prophets who taught their people how to live. But Jesus, he was different. He dove into the deep end of community and showed them what that kind of love looked like. He pulled into the center of the circle folks who had been pushed to the margin. He hoisted forgotten and neglected children onto his life. He honored the voices of women. He touched the faces of lepers. He ate with the people who were told they were unwelcome at the table. And he also engaged with those who challenged him and even demonized him, debating with the Pharisees and entering into the home of a Roman soldier to heal his son. Jesus did not place himself above anyone. Instead, the more he shares their messy human lives, the more he deeply shares his own, and the more deeply he reveals to them that God is in charge of all of us. And so to help his friends really understand the depth of this relationship, he doesn't launch into complex theological lectures. He offers them a simple metaphor. It's like this, he says. I am the vine, and you are the branches. We can't live apart from each other. We depend on each other. Even when I am gone, we will still be connected. Because God is in me, and I am in you, you are in God. Now this metaphor is simple, and it's effective, and his friends get it. You see, grapevines have a long history in Jesus' world. The oldest vineyard dates back 7,000 years. The ancient Sumerian character for life was a grape leaf. And I just want to point out that is what it's called, all up and down, the pulpit and the lectern, beautiful, intertwining, great vine. The word vitus is the botanical name for grape, and it's also the origin of the word vita, which means life. And so around that central life-giving vine are the pramata, the climbing, twisting branches that produce the fruit, that produce the grapes. The vine draws its life from the soil below and the rain that falls from above, and it is the source of the plant. And the branches, they spread out, offering leaves to soak up the sun and bear the fruit. The transformation of sunlight into sugar, the way water and nutrients are shared through the sap. It's an elaborate system, inextricably entwined. The vine and the branches need to but in Jesus' metaphor, it's deeper than a mere biological interdependency. It's intimacy. 
It's a relationship that goes well beyond the transactional or the present moment. It will remain with them long after he is physically gone. Now, he says, we walk side by side. But soon I will live in you and you in me. Today you walk in my footsteps. But soon you will walk in my feet, so to speak. You will be the hands and feet in a world that needs healing and loving and forgiving. A world in desperate need of good news. So friends, don't be afraid. I am not abandoning you. I will abide in you. And you in me. You will never be alone. I can't think of better news for us than that. That kind of trusting, loving, intertwined belongingness that intimacy with God is at the heart of Jesus' dream for us, too, right here in this place. With you and me and the generations that came before and the ones who find the courage to walk through those doors right now. It is rooted in the same intimacy with God that Jesus reminds us of. Because we are human beings made in God's image. We are entwined in it already. And when we tend to it, when we cultivate it, we will bear good fruit. We will see it around us and within us and between us. It looks like this. Genuine community. And I think that's what draws so many of us to this place. We don't gather here because we all think alike or look alike or have the same kind of gifts or needs. In fact, it's time to look around. We come here from different kinds of families. We tell different stories. We dream different dreams. But we root ourselves in the same connection to God as the people. But make no mistake. Sometimes those differences will challenge us. Sometimes in finding our lives can feel icky and painful. We've had moments here where conversations on race or identity have led to misunderstanding and hurt. There have been painful moments where privilege was called out and defenses reared up. Sometimes we get territorial over what we do here and we're reluctant to let folks share in the work and then sometimes we get resentful wondering where we might find some help. In other words, we are hurt. And because we are a place filled with human beings, it's going to get messy. But we are also a place where deep friendships form between folks who come from entirely different worlds, where young and old learn from each other, where we admit when we are wrong and we forgive often and extravagantly. And while we do sometimes shed tears together, it's a place where laughter is as common as our singing. It is the soundtrack of this church. This is a deeply rooted, down-to-earth kind of place where we can experience what it truly means to belong, not just to each other, but to God. And the fruit of that belonging is seen when we dive into the deep end of community as we experience. Friends, meeting each other is just about the holiest way that we can show that we need God. And when we bring our whole, flawed, hopeful selves to it, we will not be able to tell where the vine ends and the branches begin. And that is what Jesus leaves us with today. And that is what we can create together when we decide to show up here and be in shine with a community. And when we do, the good fruit that we bear will nourish the world. Thank you.